welcome back to another episode of Extractions and I. On today's episode, um, I mean, I'm going to be working on it for much more than today. I always feel weird saying today, and it's like going to be a reasonably long project. I'm trying to make an exotic glass, all right? TZN, it's a zinc telluride glass, and we're trying to make it because it should be highly fluorescent if we dope in a rare earth iron. Really, the point of the synthesis over this video is really just trying to make a cool glowing glass. If things go wrong and it doesn't work, which is always very likely on this channel, um, you know, it won't glow. So glow's cool, that's what we're looking for. Okay, so tellurium. How, how often do you think about tellurium? It's not one of these elements that come up very often. Generally, when people talk about tellurium, they talk about how it's stinky. There's a story, well, I mean, it's not so much a story but as a fact, but when you get exposed to tellurium, your body will break it down to dimethyl telluride or an organo tellurate kind of, and that's very stinky. It's in the same group as sulfur and selenium, but it's it's much more metallic. It's, the way we're handling it in this video, I don't expect it to be very stinky. So the one thing it's kind of known for, we're, we're not going to be <laughs> touching on that. In organic tellurium, it's not going to be particularly stinky, as long as I don't get exposed to too much, because then I might get stinky. But I'm, I'm going to try and avoid that. Tellurium is quite a rare element. If you look it up, it's about as rare as platinum. But um, you never hear anything about the tellurium price, nor is tellurium particularly expensive, which tells you a lot about <laughs> how widely it's actually used. A large chunk of it is used to make solar panels, kind of the flexible ones. They work a little bit better than normal silicon uh, ones, but, you know, they're sort of more toxic. It's one of those elements that has... <laughs> weird niches kind of in in electronics and optics tellurium based glasses so glasses made with tellurium dioxide rather than silicon dioxide are of research interest because they're low phonon glasses all right so low phonon means that they don't have a lot of vibrational modes and vibrational modes are bad when you're talking about things like fluorescence because it's a way for the matrix the the glass really to dissipate energy that isn't radiating back out the light. All of your energy going in is basically just turned into phonons, which are kind of vibrations. Most people just talk about high phonon materials or low phonon materials, because I'm unsure if the number is really exact or meaningful in any sense anyway. That's why TZN is of research interest, because if you want to make bright glasses for, I don't know, laser game materials or optical fibers, low phonon materials means you don't lose so much energy in that process. Everyone really wants to know if phonons are real, because like a photon is real, you kind of have a packet of light energy. So a phonon being a sort of a packet of sound energy, it's not really what they are. Kind of like, are they real or a mathematical concept? And they're kind of more concept based. Is a thought an object? You know what I mean? Like I can have a thought. Is a sound wave an object? Can you have a single sound wave? Sounds isn't really an object in the same way that a phonon is an object, but it's just kind of nearly a maths way of kind of explaining solid state physics, which no one really understands. Instead of emitting a photon of light, the ion instead emits a phonon of vibrational energy. It's, I mean, is it correct? Is it made up? It depends who you ask, really. TZN, telluride, zinc, glass is, yeah, very low phonon. So we're putting a dopant ion in. In this case, we're using europium. So europium ions will absorb the UV light and then re-emit red. And because they're in a low phonon glass, they should be quite bright. For our europium source, I've just bought in some europium oxide. It's, it's a cool element. It's not one you find around very often, but it does glow its characteristic red, even as the oxide under a UV torch. It feels lame to say this, but it does look a lot better in person than on camera. On camera, it just looks like the bloody expensive olive oil from our cadmium nanodots video. But in person, they're quite different. Uh, the europium emits in some really, really tight, narrow spectral bands. This is a 365 nanometer torch, which for some reason also has a strobe mode. So that feels very ravey. Shout out to everyone watching the chemistry videos in the rave, you know, on your phone in the corner. <laughs> God knows I've been there. Anyway, we're here to do synthesis, make the glass. We just need to get all of these four oxides, melt them together and then pour it out. And that should be our glass. How hard could that be? The easiest one of this is the zinc oxide. I'm fairly sure I have some zinc oxide lying around, but if not, I'm just gonna buy some off eBay. It's a dirt cheap chemical. Who cares about the zinc? Boring chemical. The europium oxide, well, you've already seen, I've just bought that, so we've got that already. So we just add that into our oxide mix before the melting. 
easy done as well. Sodium oxide is a bit of a weird chemical. It's quite reactive, very hard to get. And when you actually read the experimental, no one uses sodium oxide, or maybe some people do, but a lot of people just use sodium carbonate, which is then converted into sodium oxide in the melt. We're just gonna use some from the kilo bag we have from the pool chemical aisle at the local hardware store, easy done. So we're just left with tellurium dioxide. Our starting point is the tellurium element itself. So we need to go from tellurium metal to make tellurium dioxide. Obviously I could just buy tellurium dioxide, but we're doing some chemistry here. We have tellurium metal, so how do we make tellurium dioxide? Well, we should be able to easily dissolve tellurium in some acid. If we neutralize that acid, it should precipitate out some tellurium dioxide. I'm saying should a lot because I can't, can't say this sort of rudimentary tellurium chemistry is very easily found online. I, I think it should work, but I don't know. Anyway, assuming we collect all our oxides together, we need to melt it together. It's not terribly hot, but it's still much hotter than our hot plate. It's about 800 degrees. So once again, this is a job for the microwave furnace. We should be able to melt all these oxides together and it will make a glass of some color. I don't know. Hopefully we'll try and get something vaguely transparent, but more importantly, we want to see the glow of the europium come through. Hopefully, I don't know. It could not work. <laughs> we could do all this and it could not be fluorescent. <laughs> I'm had a few failures lately, so I'm not feeling super confident, but on that note, let's get to this project. Let's do it. All right. <laughs> All righty, here we are. Another stunning day to do some bloody chemistry outside. People are really surprised when I get so caught off guard by rain uh, and rainy days, but it really does not rain very much here. <laughs> like we're at the end of May and I looked it up how many days so far this year, so nearly six months into the year, five full months into the year, how many days has it rained? And the answer is like less than 15. <laughs> and if you just count the days where more than one millimeter of rain has fallen in that whole day, it's like eight days or something like that. So far this year it's rained, so that's pretty good. That's less than two a month, two rainy days a month. So um, here I am bragging about the weather, it's fine. I'll get skin cancer, It'll, it all evens out. So um, here we have 33.2 grams of tellurium metal. I'm not gonna handle that without the gloves, not super toxic. Well, reasonably toxic, I guess. My, my scale of what is super toxic has kind of been a bit distorted over the years. Not a healthy thing. And we're going to try and dissolve in the nitric acid. I don't know how violently it's going to react. So I'm just gonna put it in some water and just add the, add the acid in. It could react really slowly and need some heating, um, but we would rather it do that than it takes off like a rocket. So um, we've got a big beaker here, even though we probably don't need all that space, just in case it foams a lot and puts out a lot of hazardous gases. It might put off a lot of uh, nitrogen dioxide. That's always a risk when you're using um, nitric acid, especially when we're trying to sort of oxidize something. And, and we don't want a whole excess of acid too. We want to just add enough acid to dissolve up all the tellurium, which given us 33 grams, is probably quite a bit, but we just want to add enough acid so all the metal is consumed and then the solution is left at sort of a neutral pH. So if we just balance the acid additions to the amount of metal, everything should work out okay.
Okay, everything was going really good, but uh, then everything ground to a halt for some reason. I think I probably added too much peroxide and it maybe passivated the uh, tellurium against the acid. So that's that's when you, you guess you're forming that solid tellurium dioxide so quickly on the surface that it stops the acid from then reacting with the metal underneath it. And it can sometimes form a really nice like sort of impermeable surface of oxide so that the acid then can't get into the metal again. So that's maybe what I think what happens uh, because it was definitely very acidic. Where's my pH paper? Yeah, there's definitely lots of nitric acid in there. It was hot, it was like verging on boiling, but none of the pieces were even bubbling slightly. So unless we hit maybe a solubility limit or, or something weird like that. Yeah, what I did is I got out some sodium nitrite, and some Kemplayer sodium nitrite. That's a throwback. Thanks Kemplayer for sending that through back in the day. Um, Just to jump start it again, uh, put a couple of crystals in, generate a lot of nitrogen dioxide very quickly, but then uh, that kind of, I guess, consumes the uh, peroxide. And now it's back to generating its own nitrogen dioxide again. We were so close to having it done um, while it was still light and now the sun is definitely setting <laughs> because I still haven't adjusted <laughs> when they did daylight savings. I never adjust. But what I might do is I might just take off some of this top solution because the stuff settles out very quickly. I'm going to add in some fresh uh, nitric acid down the bottom just to try and really get these pieces. There's, there's probably only about a third of it left, maybe a quarter of it left, but maybe it's just the big pieces aren't really reacting. But you can see that they're not really doing very much because there's definitely a lot of tellurium dioxide precipitated out and I'd expect that to re-dissolve because it's quite acidic, but who knows, who knows? Alrighty, we're back here a couple of days later and I was thinking about this and I, I, I'm, I've come to the conclusion mentally that this is just um, passivating, surely, because it should be reacting. It's still just metal in nitric acid uh, and it's not reacting at all. <laughs> what I might do is I'll just take chunks of metal out, uh, give them a quick wash in some water, kind of vaguely dry them off and then crush them back up and then we can put them back in. It should um, you know, make a lot more surface for the acid to react with and it should all start reacting again. A little bit of excess acid in there, but we've still all got this solution, which is quite acidic still. It's kind of saturated with tellurium as well. You can see some tellurium dioxide kind of precipitating out at the bottom, or, you know, telluric acid or something maybe, because it's very acidic. But anyway, let's get this reaction happening again. <laughs> I really wanted to stop it reacting so fast. Well, just try and quench some of that nitrogen dioxide generation, but I think in doing so, I've killed the reaction completely. So I want to jump start it again. Right, here we are, here's the solution. It's been about oh, a week, maybe two weeks since we last saw it, which now makes it winter time. If you couldn't tell, it, it's it's definitely winter now. <laughs> but uh, the solution is kind of where we wanted it to end up at. But now it's here, I'm gonna kind of change my mind because we, we definitely wanted to just add enough acid so that there was gonna be some tellurium dioxide as a solid left over. We didn't have to do too much pH balancing. And we've kind of hit that point, I think a little. I think the solution is still quite acidic. And this stuff at the bottom, while it, I think it's mostly tellurium dioxide, doesn't look of great quality. It looks very gray. I think there are still bits of metal in there. And really for this glass, we're not going for yield. Forget about yield. This is one of the reasons I really like glass chemistry. <laughs> I'm doing glass chemistry here. We're not worried about yield at all, but we are worried about quality. So rather than try and recover all the tellurium here, I think it's better if we just filter off all the solid now, all that tellurium kind of crap, because I don't really know what it is. Oh, it's, I mean, it's mostly the thing we want, but a lot of the stuff we want is also dissolved in the solution as telluric acid. So if we get this nice solution and then we neutralize it, we should precipitate out very nice, pure uh, tellurium dioxide that won't have any lumps of metal in it or like, that's what I think it is, but it's weird. It just like stops reacting at a certain point. 
because it's still definitely acidic and it was heated for a very long time it has just been sitting here but you know it's not it's not bubbling at all in the slightest so it's 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 done you know yet it looks like crap so we'll filter it out we'll do this ph neutralization so we're trying to hit a ph of i think it's just slightly acidic uh so we'll add in some probably sodium carbonate neutralize the nitric acid it will neutralize the telluric acid the tellurium dioxide will precipitate out and then we'll filter that off and be left with nice solid tellurium dioxide that's that's nice and white rather than this weird gray nonsense here that's the plan Alrighty, it's been a little while. Uh, I was over in the US at open source, which, like, okay, is, is partly a brag, but also gives me someone to blame because I've come back, I left the stuff on the filter, come back now, what's up with it now? Why is it bright yellow? This is William Osmond's fault. If he hadn't invited me to the US, <laughs> I would have had nice pure product. Um, it's very important to blame someone else for your failures. Uh, all right, why is it so yellow? That's that's a great question. It potentially could be okay. There's like two phases of tellurium dioxide. I thought we were just gonna make the very common phase, but there is like a yellow phase. I mean, I'm not completely convinced that this is, ah, oh, it's pure, it's just, it's just the yellow phase. Mm, unsure. It's also not very much of it. So looking back at, all this tellurium dioxide sludge that we rejected because we wanted this nice pure bit <laughs> feels like a bit of a loss so i might collect this i'll weigh it um i'll tell you how much it is because i don't know but i know it's not very much and, and i feel like we want a little bit more so before we move on to the glass step we've got to get this tellurium dioxide down because this stuff doesn't seem to really want to react with acid very well if it is truly tellurium dioxide we should be able to dissolve it in base as well. It is an amphoteric oxide, which means it dissolves in both acidic solution and basic solution. So if we add sodium hydroxide, we should be able to make a very soluble oh, sorry, a very soluble sodium tellurite, tellurate. I think it's a tellurite, sure. We'll go with that and, and that should separate from the metal. We'll have a nice clean uh, solution of sodium tellurite and then we can acidify that back to neutral uh, the tellurium dioxide once again should drop out of solution and then we get a nice pure uh, tellurium dioxide which may or may not decide to just spontaneously go yellow like this stuff god damn it <laughs> it's exactly the kind of shitty yellow color of an impure chemical as well we'll see if this works um hopefully tellurium doesn't pull in some more nonsense on us because i feel like it's got a lot of potential for some nonsense this tellurium so we'll give it a shot So I added quite a bit of sodium hydroxide. It is very basic. And uh, some of the tellurium dioxide, well, suspected tellurium dioxide, dissolved to form a kind of a weirdly gray solution. Not as much dissolved as I either hoped for or expected to. It's amazing how, like, this element, tellurium is really refusing to cooperate with the chemistry. <laughs> you would think it would either not react or it would fully react. It's strange for half of it to dissolve and then half of it to sort of sit there and 
do nothing. That's just that's just rude, honestly. Anyway, I, I will filter off this solution. I really want to get all the suspended particles out of it, so I'll filter it through some uh, paper. It's also very basic, and it's kind of a bit a bit mean to this uh, glass frit to filter the really basic solution through because it kind of ruins the frit a little. Uh, don't ask me why it's grey. Is it grey? It's like kind of nearly even a browny bluey brown bluey brown is that a word sorry this is not a weird flex that it once again is a beautiful sunny day there are there's some clouds somewhere yeah oh steel gray hell yeah all right oh. so the grass is really growing because it rained for like three days recently and uh, so the grass really grows this door gets anyway where was i yes filtering filtering paint might not be too bad it's not too sludgy but hmm sludgier than I'd like sound I've ever heard. Here we are, fantastic. We ended up with 33 grams of tellurium dioxide, which looks pretty good. I mean, it looks how we expect it to look. I still have no idea how our first batch looks like this. <laughs> That's crazy. You'd think I would doing this on purpose by this point, making things go yellow for the bit, but I genuinely never even see it coming. How did I make a white oxide yellow like this? Anyway, 33 grams, certainly good enough for what we need to do, which is make the glass. So we have everything we need now. We got zinc oxide. Yeah, here we go. Thank you, chemical shop. If I had a shop that sold chemicals, I would also call it chemicalshop.com. It's nice, fine, fantastic. 100% zinc oxide. Keep out of reach of children. You know, the children and their zinc oxide, you know, they go nuts for it. We've already seen this. This is a uh, europium oxide. Uh, we only need really a technical term. Technical term is smidgen. We'll have a smidgen of that. We're really only making, I think, half a mole percent uh, europium doped. If you add too much, um, the sort of the ions kind of interfere and kind of get in each other's way optically. So uh, half a mole percent is generally like a good doping ratio for these kind of glasses. And this here is our sodium carbonate, um, which is kind of our stand-in for the uh, sodium oxide. I don't think people use the bloody pool chemical from the hardware store, but we're gonna do that. Uh, I'm a little worried about how non-dehydrated it is, but uh, it doesn't look too bad, so should be all right. Um, it'll, it'll, sodium carbonate absorbs a bit of water from the atmosphere. So we, I guess we gotta, once we get to the microwave, which is the next step, I guess, um, yeah, we'll, we'll try and sort of ramp the mix up, get it hot slowly rather than trying to instantly get it as hot as possible. But this looks pretty dry. It, it was a bit of a struggle to get it quite dry because it was like paint and there's still a lot of tellurium dioxide that sort of painted itself onto the glassware. That's all right. It'd be easy enough to clean because I can just dissolve it in acid, but uh, yeah, hard to recover. Anyway, uh, yeah, a bit of heat and a bit of uh, time, like a week or so in the vacuum desiccator. Looks all good. Uh, I think I'll make one glass without the europium doping because I'm kind of interested to see what kind of color we get. Hopefully we still get a, a transparent material, even if it's a bit 
sort of miscolored, we'll say. I don't really know what color it's kind of meant to be without the doping, but then it shouldn't have that much fluorescence, except there might be some background sort of ions from our, you know, hardware store grade materials that, that might light it up. So that'll be interesting. So that's an undoped version and we'll make a, a doped version as well. Once again, half mole percent. So I'll make up a big batch of the tellurium, the zinc and the uh, sodium and then split it and then put just the just a little small bit of europium into one of them. Uh, we wanna we wanna mix and grind all this up as, as nice as possible. So back to this guy again. That's it, I think. So yes. After grinding, it's, uh, yeah, it looks a little bit more wet than I would like. It's nearly getting pasty, really, actually, but uh, there's two reasons for this. First of all, uh, I just didn't really completely dry the tellurium dioxide, which kind of screws up the, the measurements, like the weighing a little bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter exactly the right ratios. The other reason is it is actually finally raining. You know, look how wet the board gets. Uh, and yeah, the sodium carbonate is hygroscopic and, you know, the humidity is, like it's it's raining <laughs> and I'm grinding sodium carbonate. So as I grind it, it's pulling water from the air and forming this kind of paste. So I, I might try and do a little bit of a preheat, keep it at 150 degrees for a little bit, just to sort of dry it out before we put it in the microwave. If I just stand here and yap on, it's gonna turn into from paste into sludge. So I gotta get to it. Right, and we're back. Once again, this microwave has made it to yet another video. And uh, same with the microwave furnace. It's looking a little bit worse for wear. Uh, some glass built last time, so I had to chip that out, because otherwise I guess it's gonna keep absorbing the microwaves and melting and then eat through the, the, the foam sort of fiberglass. So yeah, this is the third video we've used this microwave furnace. It's just a core and uh, that absorbs the microwaves, it gets really hot and makes the interior very hot. So the material itself doesn't really need to absorb the microwaves because it's kind of getting all absorbed and it's just making that internal atmosphere in there very hot. We struggled to get it sort of to 1100 degrees to, to melt the lithium niobate a couple videos ago, but um, we did melt silver pretty easily. The silver melting point's about 900 degrees. So that's about where we're going for. I think about 800, 900 degrees. Um, and then we'll pour it out onto a bit of a, maybe maybe preheated, yeah, preheated tray. This is the mix without any of the europium dopant in it. I don't even know what color it's gonna go. I mean, I could guess that it's gonna be an off yellow, <laughs> but <laughs> that's just the default assumption, really. Prove me wrong, mixture, prove me wrong. Uh, uh, it'd be great if we could keep it at that sort of 800 temperature for a couple of minutes, not just heat it up as soon as the liquefiers pour it out, but uh, really let it kind of react a little. We're undercover because it's raining, and uh, I think the first video we can actually see the numbers on the screen. I just assumed the screen didn't work, but I guess microwaves are not made to be run outside, so <laughs> anyway. Like it. 
Alrighty. Be great and easy to pour out. All right, looks perfect. Nearly spilt it. A tray over here that is preheating. Well, it's preheated, it's 250 degrees, so it's just sitting here at 250 degrees. So we'll pour it onto that. It's not annealing, it's is it annealing? Don't know. Removing the stress from the glass. I don't know how important this is going to be, but I'll give it a shot. Last time my pouring was abysmal, but at least it looks a lot runnier this time, so hopefully it works better this time. So I really haven't made any improvements to either the equipment I have, nor my skills. So give this a fucking shot though. Not the worst. It's definitely a glassy material. Um, it looked a lot sort of more transparent, but I think maybe pouring it through the air trapped a lot of air in it. I don't know if 250 was the right sort of temperature. It looks like one of the parts is, big parts is shattered as it cooled. Well, it actually still hasn't cooled. I, I put this up to 320 degrees, but yeah, it's certainly glass. It's not fluorescent at all. Um, I mean, it's still hot, so. I'll cool this down, but uh, it's definitely a great start. Uh, and then we, we'll try our eurobium doped one. Maybe we'll also go this slight yellow color. Well, it's sort of lemon yellow. A few small improvements and we're really onto something here. Fantastic. Did this, did our, did our goals get realized? Bro, did we, did we have a successful outcome? Oh, bro, I gotta cool this dead shit down. Man, bro, 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 man, dude, champ, slugger. Slugger's a good one. I like slugger. Oh, it's raining. It's <laughs> getting rain on it. No, <laughs> don't thermal shock the rain. All right, all the pieces are cooled down now. Look at this. Sorry, I've already got excited about it, but look, that's oh, beautiful. Yeah, once again, this is the undoped sample. See nothing there, you know. But even, even these small little bits of glass in the Ziploc bag here. It's somewhat transparent around the edges, which is more what we wanted the whole block to be. So it might be a cooling rate thing or, or, or something, but it could just be something in the formulation that we're not quite getting right. But the fact that it's nearly clear just around the edges kind of Seems like we were really close to getting getting a really transparent bit of glass here, but uh, still fantastic. I'm still over the moon with this. Now that I saw how sort of thin the mixture got, uh, I was expecting something really viscous, but it was quite quite thin, quite easy to pour, especially compared to the germinate glass we've made previously. I really could have made it into a mold or something, but maybe I could pretend that this is a love heart. That's a love heart, right? Uh, which way up? There, that way. 
Yeah, hell yeah. So that concludes my successful glass making for this video. Been a lot of fun doing this sort of inorganic material science-y thing. So any suggestions along those lines? Fantastic. All right, well, have a great day, everyone. I'll see you later.